All right, good morning and a happy and especially a hopeful new year to everybody. Uh, welcome to the session on big data and near real-time monitoring of food emergencies. My name is Rob Voss and I'll be your moderator for today and um, work with the International Food Policy Research Institute. With COVID-19, the appetite for real-time data has only increased. I guess we all have been monitoring the number of cases, deaths, hospitalizations, and what to make of the daily trends regarding the further evolution of the pandemic. Uh, with the increasing availability of near real-time high spatial resolution data, much of the free and publicly available, uh, it has sparked a rush of applied econ economics research looking how to improve the prediction and inference uh, to inform policymakers worldwide. One particular area of, um, of need is humanitarian assistance related to food emergencies. Um, just two months ago, last November, FAO, the World Food Program, uh, warned about imminent famines in four countries, Yemen, South Sudan, Northeastern Nigeria, and Burkina Faso. Three of these cases were also on the verge of a famine in 2017. And these warnings built on early warning systems um, can hardly be called real-time monitoring systems as they use complex on the ground assessments which take place at best uh, once or twice a year. But the food crisis risk factors are well identified. It's not just sudden shocks like um, COVID-19 but food crises are closely associated with recurring weather shocks, um, conflict, food price shocks, and economic disruptions. And there's quite a bit of interest in data science applications to improve effective early warning of food crisis risk and evaluate uh, the food assistance interventions. Significant information gaps have long impeded effective humanitarian response to food emergencies. The worst example of that was Somalia in 2011, when a famine was declared only after a quarter million people had already died of hunger. This was in 2011. So the objective of this session is to showcase several research efforts that are currently underway to improve near real-time monitoring of and responses to food emergencies using new data products that are constructed from a range of uh, new uh, different types of information from remote sensing, mobile phone, terrestrial sensors or GIS platforms, as well as machine learning algorithms. The common objective is uh, to improve the prediction and inference so as to accurately identify and even forecast maybe episodes of acute food insecurity and design and target timely policy responses. These big data advances also offer enhanced potential to undertake large scale, lower cost impact evaluation of interventions, especially those characterized by spatial discontinuities. Of course, there's a real risk that these new data sets and methods uh, get um, uh, exaggerated or maybe overhyped. So we have to carefully look at uh, and how we validate the work that we do um, and uh, to make sure that the data and methodological improvements uh, really uh, serve um, policy needs as well as uh, our accurate representations uh, of realities. So this morning's sessions will, will feature four paper presentations um, on these topics. Um, each paper presentation will take about 20 minutes and after each there will be uh, time for questions and discussion. Before moving to the first uh, presentation, let me first thank Chris Barrett for putting this session together. And I think it's uh, promised to be a very exciting session. Um, second, so I'd also like to point at some related interests you may wanna check out uh, after this session, uh, which we have uh, ongoing at IFPRI through our food security portal, which provides a hub of early warning systems for food crisis. Um, and thirdly, as um, we proceed with the presentations, uh, each of the presentations, please submit your questions or comments in the Q&A uh, box um, at the bottom of this um, Zoom application. 
And after each presentation, I'll group uh, questions and pass them on to the presenters. So um, without further ado, since we do have a hard stop at 12 o'clock, so we'll end there. So we'll keep a close eye on the time. Let me um, give the floor to the speakers. Um, I'll introduce them as they take the floor. Um, let me first give the floor to Kathy Bayliss, who's joining us from uh, British Columbia, but is with the University of Illinois, to give the first presentation of her paper with co-authors on predicting food insecurity with machine learning. Kathy, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, Rob. And thanks everybody. And again, I wanted to echo Rob's thanks to Chris for putting this together. This is a very timely discussion um, and I'm, I'm excited to, to be part of it. So I'm gonna present a, a model that we've been working on. A, a few of us, um, including Aaron Lance, Hope Michelson, who are here, Eugen Zhao is a recent PhD grad. Um, well, we're trying to use machine learning to predict uh, food insecurity. And basically it's, it's we're, what we're trying to do is near-term forecasting. So forecasting a month out. Um, Rob already nicely motivated why this is important. And I don't think given 2020 that, that I need to spend much time on trying to motivate the fact that food insecurity is a problem. It was a problem and was a growing problem even before COVID. Uh, so we, there's this, it, after you know, a number of decades of trying of reducing, uh, making some progress in terms of food insecurity, we've seen this uptick over the last five years, which is really worrying. We wanna have these methods, these models that can help identify places and times where we have food insecurity crises. Like Rob said, there's a bunch of new data out there and analytical methods that might be used in this place. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to use data that are generally available to develop a, a model that could be uh, automatically updated and generalizable. So what we do is we build a machine learning model to predict food security uh, sort of cluster level. So think of village level food security, um, in food insecure uh, locations. And what we do is we're using LSMS data, uh, the Living Standards Measurement Survey data uh, for Malawi, Tanzania, and Uganda as sort of our test case. And we're using that as our ground truth. We're taking the two prior waves of data to predict the most recent year of data. And again, we're specifically focusing in on trying to predict food, what we're defining as food insecure villages. We also use data on food prices from those areas, as well as a bunch of data from on weather shocks um, from the prior growing season, along with a bunch of other kind of things like sort of various asset measures that could conceivably be uh, um, gotten from uh, remote sensing data. So for example, like roof type um, and things like distance to market, et cetera, et cetera, to aid in our predictions. And this is where I'm going to spend a little bit of time on because this is where I think what we're doing may be a little different than at least stuff we've done in the past. And that's been trying to use uh, various data techniques on over uh, oversampling and cost sensitive learning to, imp to improve our prediction. What we get are machine learning models that have somewhere that are, that are somewhere between 70 to 80% probability of being right. The trick is, I mean, that, that's sort of a that's sort of the that's the nice punchline. The more problematic punchline is that when when we focus in on recall, i.e., trying to identify the majority of villages that are actually food insecure, where uh, that accuracy drops uh, a fair bit. That said, we can we can reach about decent balance, um, about uh, 70 80 percent accuracy. Uh, as soon as we try to bump that up to to having 90% recall, to get 90% of the food insecure village is identified, we are identifying a lot of villages that are not so food insecure. So that's a, that's kind of the punchline. We've got this trade-off between recall and precision that could be very problematic in some ways, right? I mean, it is problematic in that we can't say we have a, a model that gets it all right all the time. 
However, if that model is being used to target places of concern where uh, say a government might go in and try to get more information, maybe having a number of villages that we misidentify as being food insecure that are actually okay may not be as big a problem. And so that's what I'm gonna spend a little bit of time kind of thinking through. So firstly, what do we determine, how are we deciding a village is food insecure? Well, we're, we're using what I think has been used by FuseNet, which is to look at uh, villages that have households, more than 20% of the households that are food insecure. We define that based on the reduced coping strategies index or the, and the food consumption scores. So we run a couple of different models. We use these oversampling methods uh, as well as cost sensitive learning, as I mentioned, to try and, try and do a better job of targeting these more relatively rare events. We're using tree-based methods, machine learning methods, um, and uh, sort of receiver operating characteristic curves, I'll more detail on that later, to try and uh, measure how well our models are doing. Lastly, one thing in this kind of uh, data setting where you've got a lot of spatial correlation and a lot of temporal correlation, we wanted to take, we wanted to be thoughtful about how we test our models. So we don't want to test our models by picking neighboring villages of a bunch of villages that we're using to train our, our model data set. So what, what we do is we basically use the, again, as a, the two prior waves of data to predict, to forecast essentially the more recent um, data as our, as our test set. And so that in so doing, we're trying to break some of that, that problem with correlation, which would, which would tend to say that our model is, would be doing better than it actually was. Okay, so because what we're trying to predict is something that is um, not a rare enough event, but still a relatively rare event, we spend a bit of time, we're worrying about these tails of the distribution, right? And, and so, I mean, it's a lot easier to predict something if you've got a 50-50 chance of seeing it happening. But when you've got more like a 10% chance of seeing it happening, we want to, we might care about having a model that's doing a really good job of predicting that tail because you could have an incredibly accurate model, right? If your whole model said, nobody's food insecure, we're done. It would be very accurate, but not at all useful, right? So uh, yeah, we want to have something that's doing a good job of getting these tails. To do that, we use a try a number of different methods, either sort of oversampling the majority class, i.e. food secure villages. We also try um, oversampling food insecure villages. We also use a couple of these synthetic methods that actually essentially replicate data, um, sort of create fake data in the region that look very similar to the minority class, i.e. food insecure villages. And it turns out that works reasonably well. Um, this paper is in part a horse race, which is kind of a, in some ways a horse race I would argue is less interesting in that, yeah, we're comparing our, our machine learning models to a standard kind of uh, logistic model. Um, but uh, in some ways I think what's, what's more interesting is looking at the, the machine learning models with and without these various oversampling methods. Just again, a reminder of what we've got in terms of our, our variables that we're using to predict food insecurity or our features in machine learning parlance. We're using things like food prices, whether we actually observe a food price in the local market the month before um, the, the time we're trying to predict. We use a number of lags. We use one month lag, three month lag, six month lags of a whole bunch of different products, not just maize, but also uh, nuts, uh, sort of ground nuts, um, uh, oh, rice, I think we've got in there, cassava, et cetera. Use assets, but the idea is we're trying to use assets that we could conceivably get from elsewhere, like cell phone ownership. We also use a, a roofing material, um, we've got, uh, we've, then we create a bunch of variables based on weather on, in, in primarily we're worried about weather for the, pre the previous growing season. Um, here we cheat in a way in that we're creating, we're handcrafting some features. We're not just sort of arbitrarily throwing in every single temperature and, uh, rainfall measure. We're creating things like length of dry spells, average temperature, growing degree days, heating degree days, uh, total rainfall, that sort of stuff. So stuff we think matters agronomically. 
then we use some data on location, distance to road, uh, that sort of stuff. So that's that's what we got in there. We also, th also throw in months and regional fixed effects, um, just because we know that these countries have lean seasons, so you're more likely to see food insecurity in, in February in Malawi, for example. Um, and some regions have persistently sort of bad food insecurity levels. And so partially we wanted to see, we wanted to double check that our model isn't being driven only by these fixed effects that it can actually outperform that. In terms of results metrics, what we're gonna look at is we, we're gonna be particularly interested in recall. By that, I mean, we wanna know the proportion of truly food insecure villages that we're able to identify. On the other hand, because I mean, if we wanted to identify all food insecure villages, we could just say everybody's food insecure, we're done. But again, that would be a very uninteresting model, just like saying nobody's food insecure, saying everybody's food insecure is not helpful. We do care about precision, right? And the idea here is that we face a trade-off and that trade-off should really be determined by how these, this model is gonna be used. Is it being used to go and collect more information, in which case you might be willing to um, sacrifice a little bit more precision, or is it being used to trigger aid? where maybe um, having more imprecision is, is gonna be politically problematic. I'll show you what we did, but again, know that that's, that, that that's an objective function that one can easily tweak in these kind of models and one should be ideally trying to set along with the policymakers in, uh, that one's working with that are gonna use these data. We're gonna use, again, receiving operator characteristics, um, the sort of area under the curve. This is standard in machine learning, but not so standard in economics. So give me just one second to explain how to read some of these things. Um, so what, what, this, what the receiver operating characteristic does is it's basically mapping out your true positive rate, sort of how, what fraction of the food insecure villages are we actually capturing? against the false positive rate, how many food secure villages are we saying are food insecure as we increase, this, increase the threshold for determining what's food insecure. So that's what's happening sort of along that as we sort of move up to the, to the Northeast in that figure. And a area under the curve if of one would mean that you basically have get fully 100% sort of true positive rate, no false positive rate, until you basically reach a threshold um, that says everybody is, uh, is food insecure. So, so you have perfect prediction if you've got an area under the curve of one. If you've got a 0.5, it's basically no, no better than flipping a coin. And so the bigger than 0.5 you can get, the better your model is doing, in short. Okay. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna fix a true positive rate that we care about. So say we say we want to have 0.7 of the villages of the food insecure villages. So 70% of the food of the food insecure villages we want to be sure to identify, and we're going to see all right how bad how many false positives are we getting if we fix some kind of recall rate. Okay, and so those are the numbers I'm going to be presenting as our results. The data again we're going to use LSMS data. I think everybody's comfortable with that. What's nice is that it's uh, a relatively large N, um, certainly large N in terms of households, in terms of clusters. Uh, so villages, we're talking about um, somewhere between 200 to 600 per wave. Okay. Results, punchline. So first we, and I'm just gonna show results from Malawi and Tanzania, not Uganda, just for, for space. Um, generally are, uh, and so the, the top row there is for the food consumption score metric, the bottom row is for the reduced coping strategies index. In general, our machine learning models are doing better than the simple logistic. Okay, it turns out also our simple logistic is frankly not doing that well at all. So maybe that's not as impressive as you, as you might hope. When we then take the machine learning models and apply some of these oversampling methods, they do even better which is hopeful. And what's kind of nice is they do better overall, right? So, so okay, the oversampling seems to, seems to work. Um, in table format, what I'm gonna show here in terms of these tables is if we fix that recall rate at 70% and then 90%, what do things look like? Well, so 
our accuracy that the uh, is okay. It's maybe not great. It's a, you know around. It's in some, for some models between fifty percent above fifty percent, but other models it's only for the, the around twenty percent for the machine learning models. However. Once we get, once we add in the oversampling, things are doing much better. Again, we're, we're getting much higher accuracy levels for all of those. That said, if you're thinking, but wait, an accuracy level of 50% is not giving me tons of confidence in this model. I totally take your point. And this is why I would argue this is, a, you know, we've, we've still got work to do. Um, Punchline is machine learning is certainly more accurate than non-machine learning or non-machine learning models for a given recall rate and oversampling seems to be making it better. When we try to do this again at the 90% recall rate, in general, it, what was sort of interesting to us is that, again, oversampling seems to help, but the higher recall threshold is not always as costly as we thought it would be. So it's actually not driving up our imprecision. It's not you know, making it a lot less accurate um in in most situations so okay then what i want to spend just the last two minutes of time here talking about is it you, you have two more minutes yes oh okay uh, so what we have i mean one of the concern about these machine learning models and particularly in a policy application is that they are a black box arguably right so you you want it you you don't want to necessarily say here trust us our magic our magic model, oh please, policymakers, to make these huge humanitarian decisions. You want to have a sense of what's actually driving some of some of these results, and also from a modeler perspective, you want to kind of make sure that this is making sense, right? So we do we do a couple of things. One thing is we just took our output and regressed it against uh, month, uh, well month by year, and location. For location, we used IPC zones. Uh, fixed effects, just to see how much variation those fixed effects were were capturing in our model, and whether our model was varying over was capturing variation over space and time. So one thing which is kind of comforting is our model did a fair bit, but is 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 picking up a lot more variation than just those kind of two way fixed effects. The other thing that was comforting is that, is that our model is picking up some variation over time, which has tended to be a problem in some of these machine learning uh, models being used to predict things like poverty, um, is that they're very good in, in picking up cross-sectional variation, but less good in predicting sort of variation over time and space. And, and ours is doing that. That said, it's still picking up a lot more cross-sectional variation than temporal variation, which is a, is a, little, a little worrying. Then we use shapely values. What's nice about these is they're model agnostic, so we can run the same sort of interpretation tool regardless of the model that we're looking at. And we just sort of see what, what variables seem to be explaining our model predictions the most. So, uh, and there are things like again, growing season rainfalls. This is just for Malawi, but we see similar patterns. We see a, a lot of weather variables coming in, we see and coming in in ways that make sense comforting. Uh, we see prices kicking in, and prices not just of maize, but of other products, which was interesting. And we also see assets. So long story short, we're all sort of three types of our variables are mattering, and they're mattering in ways that make sense, which was comforting. Um, we can also compare what we see for the models with and without oversampling. Like, do we see a big change in, in what what drive what's driving them? Mostly, they seem relatively similar. Sometimes uh, the the weather variables actually seem to matter a little bit more for uh, the in the oversampling models. Then we do an error analysis, and we sort of we look to see where are we getting getting it right and where are we getting it wrong. These error analyses, I should note, are for the ninety percent recall model um, that's using oversampling, uh, and so just just to be clear, what we've got here in those pie charts, this is the two green areas are the fraction that we're getting right. The dark green are the, the places that are truly food insecure that we're getting, that we're able to identify. The light green are places that are truly not food insecure by our somewhat arbitrary definition and that we are getting correct. The blue are places that are not food insecure that we are identifying as food insecure. 
In the red wedge, these are the folks we're particularly worried about in that these are the truly food insecure villages that we're missing. And so we, so we mapped that out to try to see whether there's some specific areas that were, were problematic. Um, and, and we see that it doesn't seem to be a strong geographic connection. We also looked urban versus rural. We don't see sort of strong differences in our uh, degree of accuracy across, across that. Um, and then we also sort of looked at when we're missing, how far are we missing by? So this is the district distribution of households. So this outer ring here represents the distribution of households that are food insecure versus secure in each of those types of villages, right? So our target is picking villages that have more than 20% of households that are food insecure. And so again, that'd be you this. Bring it to a close, uh, Kathy. Yep. yep, sorry. So Punchline of this is our misses are closer than, than our hits. So when, when we're missing villages, we're misidentifying villages um, as sort of the food safe villages that are truly food secure, and we're calling them food insecure, they aren't, they aren't as screamingly food secure. They don't have as many households that are very, very, very food secure as, as those that we're getting. If that makes sense. So summary of results. Machine learning models seem to be helping. The oversampling methods seem to be helping. All of the, our metrics, our, our indicator variables are, are making sense in terms of how they're, how they're predicting things. Um, lots of caveats. So I think we have a proof of concept here. It's not, it's not perfect uh, by any means. But we've learned a few things, and, and one of the big things we've learned is that, that these machine learning models are, are, it's very able to, it's very easy, I guess, to, to figure out, to tune the models based on how these data are going to be used. Uh, are, again, are these data being used to target for more information gathering? Are they being used to distribute aid? And that may, that may lead, feed into sort of the exact target you're trying to, to meet with these models and the sort of the weight you put on recall versus precision. The other thing that's really important, and I think everybody here probably knows this, is, is actually spending some time trying to do a check into interpretability of these models and see, are we getting things right in some places and not in others? What do the errors look like? That's it. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Kathy. This is very fascinating research that you're doing. Um, um, in the meantime, we have one question in the Q&A box, so if others want to add to it, let me um, first raise that question and then add to, to my own to it, so to get things started. So um, the, the question was in the um, chat box from Anna uh, Georgieva, uh, is could you explain what the red and blue dots in the Shapley value chart um, mean? So it's, that will be the first question. Um, my two questions are, first, can you say a bit more about your dependent variable? Because you seem to be um, referring to a binary variable, whether people are, or villages are food insecure or not. Of course, in the early warning systems, they use degrees of food insecurity in different scales. So uh, does that matter for your outcomes and degree of precision? Um, I think it's rather important whether it's uh, just food insecure or different degrees of needs for food assistance as, as the food agencies uh, uh, define it. Uh, and my second question is about uh, the endogenous policy responses, right? So if this is to serve a, um, an early warning system, um, then basically when you foresee that there might be a famine or a severe food insecurity situation, then the troops are being called in from WFP or from other organizations to provide food aid and to attenuate the situation. Um, so if you want to predict uh, a food crisis uh, of, of that kind, you, you may have an endogeneity problem, right? You may not be able to predict it. If, if your model is, is good as an early warning system, then you always get it wrong, right? So that's right. what I would say. So so question here, Morris, is how would you take account of this, uh, the policy and the geneity which didn't seem to be in your specification? Okay, three questions, back to you. Great, thanks Rob. Um, Anna, uh, 
personally lo lovely to, to see you online. Uh, so the, and, and apologies for flying by the, those, those maps. So the, the blue dots were our misses. Um, those are the locations that are food secure. And I'll get to Rob's question about what we mean by that in, in just a second. Uh, that, that we're identifying as food insecure versus the green dots are ones we're getting right. Light green dots are places that are not, are basically food secure that we're identifying as food secure. Dark green are food insecure that we're identifying as food insecure. And in what we're using again is, is we're using a binary cutoff um, to say it's it, where we're trying to target villages with more than 20% of the households that are food insecure. I, Rob, your point about sort of, you know, why, why binary does that make sense is a really good one. In some way, in, in we've, in fact, our earlier work used uh, continuous scales. Um, I mean, because we're, we're using continuous uh, data in terms of RCSI or food consumption score to then sort of create this artificial cutoff. Um, and frankly, our models, when we were using the continuous scales, were working better. What we really wanted to, to do here was sort of was pick this binary classification setting so we could sort of do a, really try to drill down in terms of understanding this oversampling uh, methods, et cetera, et cetera. They could also be used in, especially if you had multiple classes, you could still do, uh, you could still do, and I think I would argue that from our results, it would still help to use some of these oversampling um, it's, uh, methods in those kind of multiple classes, but um, it's it, we, we sort of wanted to take the extreme case where we're just using a, a binary. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I always it always drives me slightly nuts when we force things into a binary when we don't need to. <laughs> but uh, in some ways, we thought that was a slightly harder problem, so we wanted to kind of see if, see if we can if we can get at this, and then I, it, it would we could easily sort of convert that to a more classification thing, or to have multiple classes. Uh, your point about the policy endogeneity is 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 obviously bang on. Uh, we've got, I mean, in some ways we want our model to be to, to be bad, to predict badly, right? Is it's that, that we've identified these places that then turn out to be um, less food uh, insecure than we we predicted. Um, in our in our context we, I mean, so we are not taking into account existing on the ground food insecurity, um, uh, the relief efforts that were taken into account here in that, in, in when we're looking at how well our model performed. And so that's a, that's a very good point. We probably, we would probably want to, we're also working in places with uh, Malawi with some exception, um, but Uganda, Tanzania, weren't having as severe food insecurity crises during these time periods. Uh, and so we're, it's not as it's not like if uh, the situation like Somalia um, or southern Sudan, et cetera, right, where where there's a lot of aid efforts that were in place. Um, but it would be good to kind of at least probe at that a bit. And that's something we haven't done yet. So that's a thank you. That's a that's a very good thought. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, but maybe just on the previous point on the dependent variable, one way to go about it would be use a categorical um, variables for your um, uh, dependent variable. So like uh, what the IPC does, uh, uh, phase three, four, and five, right? So five being famine and then three and four pretty severe to have different degrees if, if that's measurable, right? So it could be yeah. one way to consider. Yeah, and we did we did try this with sort of severely food insecure versus sort of moderately food insecure villages. Um, I mean, one thing we didn't want to end up trying to predict the IPC uh, classification system itself, since that itself is usually used as a predictive measure. We're, we're really trying to predict what what was actually happening. Um, but uh, but yes, I. It, Definitely, we, we have poked around a little the, at the, some of the categorical stuff. We, we will do more. Yeah. Okay. Well, excellent. So, thank. I don't see any further questions. So, thank thank you, Kathy, and all the co-authors. Um, but please make your PowerPoint paper available. I guess will be of wider wider interest. Uh, very uh, interesting progress uh, that you've made. Um, well, we'll. we'll 
take these issues further on with the next presentation, um, which is on forecasting correlated poverty and malnutrition indicators for targeting, monitoring and evaluation purposes. And again, a multi-authored uh, paper, but the presentation will be done by Lyndon McBride of uh, St. Mary's College. Uh, Lyndon, you have the floor. Hi, good morning, thank you. And I, I wanna thank you, Rob, for chairing the session and, and Chris for, for organizing. And thank you, Kathy, for a, an excellent paper that um, actually serves as a great counterexample of what I'm gonna be talking about in, in, in this paper. Um, everything you've done is, is very thoughtful in terms of the, the purpose and use case of your, your machine learning informed model. This paper is forecasting poverty and malnutrition for early warning, targeting, monitoring, and evaluation. And this is, is joint work with, uh, within the context of a larger project. So I have uh, an excellent team of co-authors here, uh, two of whom are in this session, Chris and uh, Yen Yen. And I'll be reporting within the context of this paper on some of our, our joint work, which is led by Chris Brown. Uh, and then I believe that Yen Yen will be reporting on, on work uh, completed by a subset of this team in, in her session. Oh, there we go. All right, I want to begin with some lessons that are made deeply salient by the events of 2020. Uh, and that is that emergencies can arise quickly and that they affect, affect their greatest devastation on communities that are already vulnerable. For agencies to respond to these rapidly emerging emergencies and to reach the most vulnerable populations, uh, they need information, um, data and models that help them identify those groups and also anticipate um, the emergency and the consequences of the emergency. However, significant information gaps exist and impede efficient and effective humanitarian response. All right, so we begin with this, this, this knowledge that agencies need appropriate tools for response. And, and we also note that data on human movement, human behavior, human interaction, the natural and cultivated environments is growing rapidly exponentially. Uh, this big data revolution combined with simultaneous improvements in data science methods, machine learning tools, has allowed us to produce some really, uh, us, <laughs> people in this field, to produce some really uh, fascinating and, and efficient, effective tools for agencies that, that seek to respond to uh, humanitarian emergencies. Um, so I have listed here high quality subnational maps, whether they're mal mal malnutrition maps, poverty targeting maps, or capture some other aspect of of deprivation, that literature has moved very quickly uh, and um, uh, produced some, some really timely, high accurate predictions. The paper Kathy just presented is, is a, a great example of this. I'll have to add it to my list of citations. Uh, there's been some progress made with household level poverty and malnutrition targeting. Uh, and an area that uh, we're still sort of making progress in is, is early warning. Um, so the question that we bring to this paper that, that frames it is can data revolutionize, big data revolutionize poverty targeting, malnutrition targeting, mapping, uh, mapping uh, monitoring and evaluation and, and forecasting? The answer is obviously yes. Uh, the papers in this session are all evidence of that. Uh, however, we want to urge caution and careful consideration in the use of, of big data and machine learning methods for the purpose of targeting, mapping, mapping monitoring and evaluation and, and forecasting. Uh, for example, there are serious trade-offs between asset-based models, models that are informed by the theory of uh, asset dynamics and poverty traps versus those that simply use the most predictive feature set uh, available in the data. An asset-based model is going to better identify uh, the long-term or chronic poor, whereas a model based on the most predictive feature set 
is going to uh, better identify the, the current core. Uh, in addition, there, there are serious trade-offs between a highly predictive model with hundreds of features from disparate sources versus a, a lean data tool, a tool that's um, uh, simple, transparent, easy to use, easy to update, uh, easy to implement in the field. Now, with this audience, I, I know that I'm preaching to the choir. Again, Kathy's, uh, the paper Kathy just presented is, a, is an excellent example of a team of researchers carefully, thoughtfully thinking about the purpose, the use case, the uh, intention, uh, the policy implications, policy use of a model from the beginning to the end. Uh, the intended audience for this paper is, um, and I end up reviewing a lot of papers of this nature, those who have the skill set, maybe um, uh, training in computer science, machine learning methods, uh, in the desire to use those tools to tackle poverty and malnutrition, but don't have um, a good understanding of the, the state of the field, the purpose, the use cases of, of some of these models, maps, um, and tools. Uh, so uh, from this audience, I would really welcome any feedback you have uh, so that I can you know, revise the paper to better reach uh, the intended audience. All right, so some of the questions uh, we, we hope that model developers were asked is what type of deprivation is being mapped, targeted, monitored, or forecasted? Is it, is it uh, chronic poverty? Is it current poverty? Is it chronic food insecurity? Is it current food insecurity? What is the time horizon for the model? Are you predicting out of sample in the next period? Or are you predicting out of sample in the next county? Uh, how transparent or accessible does the final model need to be? Uh, some agencies do not like to work with black box methods. Um, some tools are, are just infeasible to implement in the field. Uh, how odorous is the data collection and curation task? A uh, highly predictive model that draws on data from uh, many, many different sources uh, may be very difficult to maintain and update. So our overall message in this paper is that one needs to fit tools to tasks to best meet the, the purpose, needs, and use cases of a given agency. The outline of the talk is, uh, is going to involve walking through some of these, uh, these tensions or trade-offs between different, different tools and tasks. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk about targeting versus mapping, then current versus chronic states of deprivation then static versus dynamic models. And then I'll close with some comments about data, data needs, data challenges moving forward. Under each of these sections, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the innovations, recent innovations, uh, some of the challenges and some of the frontiers uh, within each of these fields, within each of these tasks. All right, the first distinction is between targeting and mapping. Uh, so targeting tools tend to parameterize a tool, for, a tool for targeting and the monitoring and evaluation of, of households. There tends to be a flow measure on the left-hand side and stock measures on the right-hand side, such as, as um, household-level assets or, or characteristics. Uh, mapping tends to estimate spatial distribution of deprivation. Uh, for targeting, monitoring, evaluation of geographic areas uh, or aggregate, aggregate households at, at, you know, at some level of aggregation. Now, obviously, these are not hard and fast lines. Targeting tools can be used for, I'm sorry, mapping can be used for targeting um, and, and, and even vice versa. But in general, targeting identifies poor or malnourished people while mapping identifies poor or malnourished places. The trend in targeting, um, the emerging trend, is to use this, this scorecard approach, uh, which is to say um, using machine learning or some other method to identify a, a small set of household characteristics or assets um, 
that can then that parameterize that small set of, of household assets or characteristics and then apply that tool out in the field for again rapid targeting or, or monitoring and evaluation purposes um, this was was popularized as the scorecard approach by mark schreiner um, and uh, has been uh, really advanced by Kirschgar and uh, co-authors such as, as Bayes et al. Um, Kirschgar and Bayes uh, produced these really nice uh, lean data models that, again, are really easy to, to implement in the field. They use just eight to 10 um, assets or household characteristics. Um, they're very transparent, very simple. Another important innovation in this field is the use of high frequency data where available. Um, and this, this is something I'll talk about further when I talk about um, dynamic models and, and data. Um, the more high frequency data we have, the, the more we can do here. Um, and then a, a very recent innovation by Elton Dog and co-authors is using data that's already held by government sources on vulnerable populations to implement, not just develop, but implement uh, a, a poverty targeting tool. So they demonstrate that data held by the Lebanese government on Syrian refugees allows them to uh, target households with uh, the same type of accuracy one would get with a, a, a proxy means test targeting tool that went you know, household to household. Uh, this is a really valuable innovation because uh, implementation is one of the challenges of a, of a, a household level targeting tool. Now, mapping innovations have come, I think, along much more rapidly than, than have targeting in, innovations. And this is lar in large part due to um, the data. For um, household level poverty targeting, we generally need data with which to, to, to ground truth, um, parameterize the model, um, and household level data just lags behind a number of these other um, really exciting big data sources. So the trend here is combining different data inputs using transfer learning, convolutional neural, net, neural networks, or other ML methods or other methods we've recently decided on machine learning methods like elastic net um, to estimate measures of deprivation at, at local levels, um, increasingly um, uh, granular geographic levels. Some of the really valuable innovations in this field are the use of cell data records, um, the use of night lights, daytime satellite imagery, and DVI, or other types of remotely sensed data. Uh, the combination of data sources um, targeting not just asset poverty, but multi-dimensional poverty indices. Um, using open source data as opposed to proprietary data or data that's not generally accessible to the general public. And then most recently, the, the joint work um, led that I'm doing with this, this team of researchers led by Christopher Brown using multivariate prediction of correlated outcomes. So harnessing the dependency between say malnutrition and poverty to improve the prediction of, of, of each of these uh, each of these outcomes. Some of the frontiers in both targeting and mapping include better targeting the, the multi-dimensional nature of deprivation. Uh, HUD et al. 2017 show that, that some of these really exciting mapping tools that have been used by, for example, Jane et al. and Ye et al. Uh, to identify households that fall below um, a acid index or a poverty index don't work quite as readily when trying to predict uh, malnutrition whether it's a uh, wasting, uh, wasting, stunting, or um, BMI. Uh, an additional frontier, and um, Kathy's paper uh, tackles this really well using the oversampling strategy, is predicting these low probability outcomes um, or alternatively noisy outcomes. Um, and oversampling is a, a great strategy 
for that. And I, this is the first hurricane paper I've seen that, that does that, so fantastic. Um, yeah, addressing some of the limitations of the available data, Blumenstock has um, two great papers where he points out that nightlights aren't necessarily going to give us the information we need about the poorest of the poor. Uh, and then Yeah, et al. point out that we can actually move beyond mapping to identifying the determinants of geographically concentrated poverty. All right, the, the next set of trade-offs I want to highlight is identifying those who are chronically in a state of deprivation versus those who are currently in a state of deprivation. As we know, the, the poor and the malnourished at any point in time include those who are currently uh, poor and malnourished as well as those who are moving in and out of that state. Now there's some evidence that the transitory poor and food secure make up the majority of the poor and the food insecure. I have an image here um, based on data or a pie graph based on data from Kippenberg et al. Um, where about 10% between nine and 10% of the households um, in a high frequency data set in Malawi between 2017 and 2018 are chronically food insecure and the rest are moving in and out of that state and the spell links um, differ uh, dramatically. So if our objective is to target this nine or 10 percent of those who are chronically poor, uh, we may have to think very carefully about, about our methods, um, as more likely we're going to be picking up a lot of these transitory poor. There's tension between the asset-based theory and empirics of poverty traps. Uh, which is to say that asset holdings are, are really important inputs and outputs in uh, the model that you're developing if you want to capture long-term deprivation, the, the chronically poor, the chronically malnourished. There's tension between that approach to poverty targeting and malnutrition targeting and the big data, you know, just identify the most predictive feature set. Uh, the more data you have, the better. Um, Trying to get the, the highest sort of sample R squared. There's tension there because asset, asset data tend not to be big data. We need, and a lot of these papers rely on DHS data or LSMS data, but um, there's many geographic areas not covered and there's long, uh, long periods between uh, uh, survey, uh, survey collection for both of these data series. Now, the good news is that uh, recent mapping models do relatively well predicting asset poverty across space. Um, and uh, okay predicting um, asset poverty over time. So, so some of these models are in fact able to catch up, uh, pick up on, on chronic deprivation. I know I'm getting short on time here, so I'll who's that. Um, so some of the frontiers with uh, chronic versus uh, current um, states of deprivation being identified, whether using targeting or mapping, are parsing the persistently poor from the dynamically mobile. Carter and Barry refer to this as a fourth generation well-being assessment. Um, the idea would be to, to bring well-being dynamics into uh, the mapping, modeling, or targeting effort. Um, and another frontier here might be resilience targeting or resilience mapping. All right, the final set of trade-offs I wanna highlight are static versus dynamic. Mapping and targeting efforts due to the nature of the data that we have available tend to produce static models. Static models are important, especially for, for monitoring and evaluation and out of sample targeting uh, across space. However, if we wanna do out of sample targeting over time, uh, as, as we, you know, we do when we produce early warning systems, that we need to identify those who are gonna be poor, malnourished, or food secure, insecure in the next period. Um, this would require anticipating the impact of shocks on vulnerable populations. Our concern here is with changes and not simply with levels. Um, and again, the, this would require us to, if we were interested in those who are uh, likely most likely to be impacted, it would require us to model welfare dynamics um, and, and, and use, rely on um, panel data, 
which is in short supply. So some of the innovations here are using uh, high frequency data. Mude et al. and Lens et al. Um, both have uh, great papers uh, showing that you know, we can gain some traction in, in predicting food security uh, over future time periods. Um, Tang et al. and Ye et al. both show that convolutional neural networks trained on changes in satellite imagery over time can actually predict changes in consumption of asset wealth in, in future periods, again, with, with, only, with limited accuracy. Um, and Brown et al. produce, um, and this, this again is the joint paper with the same team of researchers behind this one. So in, in this paper, we distinguish between contemporaneous and sequential prediction of correlated, correlated asset wealth and malnutrition indicators, where contemporaneous prediction is predicting out of sample geographically, and sequential prediction is predicting out of sample temporally. Uh, and we, we, we find some success in, in this correlated prediction. And then can yeah. I ask you to try and bring it to a close? Or? Yes, yeah, no uh, problem. Um, so just to point out some of the frontiers with static versus dynamic model, um, we need high frequency data. Um, one of the challenges that the, the slowest changing features have the highest predictive power. Um, geographic targeting is, is very powerful. Um, we need to better integrate time series statistics with, with machine learning tools um, with application in these settings. They're, in other settings, they, they, they fully embrace the integration, but we, we lag a little bit behind. Um, I'm gonna skip over the data section and just land at the conclusion because I think um, this audience will, will know that data availability and creation is a serious limitation to what we can do. So in conclusion, big data and machine learning methods are revolutionizing mapping, targeting, monitoring, valuation, and early warning. Effective use, efficient use, requires thoughtful consideration of the purpose and use cases of the map, the tool, the model. Um, and then a final caution that no matter how good the, the data or the, the algorithm are, um, no model is gonna be effective without political will and, and financial support. All right, I'll stop there, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lyndon. Um, so a reminder to everybody, if you have comments, questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, uh, I didn't see any come in, but I always have questions myself, so let me, uh, Erase one yourself, but particularly the point you raised was a very interesting overview of, of new literature on these things. But particularly, I guess, of his interest in the context of food crisis is this notion of chronic versus acute, right? So, you um, mentioned a few related issues that have to do with um, chronic or transitory poverty. Um, now, in terms of, um, I'd like to hear your view on that. For when it comes to malnutrition, there's defined definition for child malnutrition between wasting and stunting. But there's quite a bit of, um, um, how do you call it? Um, well, lack of agreement, or maybe that's the best way of putting it, that how to address this in the context of food crisis. So, uh, FuseNet. Uh, FEO's IPC and, and WFP, they basically focus on um, acute food insecurity, as they call it, right? So people in, assist, in need for food assistance. Um, but how that relates to chronic food insecurity, which typically is captured by FEO's food insecurity indicators, um, that's sort of a distinct area of analysis. So in terms of your um, overview. So, how would you approach and bring those um, potentially bring those elements together, and particularly look at well whether people have short spells of acute food insecurity, what it means for chronic food insecurity. Thank you. That's a fantastic question, and I don't I don't want to suggest that we we shouldn't be concerned about or target those who are in acute states of deprivation. 
Uh, my, my point is more to make clear that we, we need to be aware of which type of deprivation we're targeting. We'll use different feature sets to inform a model that's interested in targeting the, the long-term deprived versus those who are experiencing an, an acute shock. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't wanna suggest that, that acute deprivation is, 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 is not important. It, it is important. Um, and you know, that, that can come down to the, uh, the agency that seeks to use the model, right? And I, and I think this is one of the goals of this paper is to serve as a, a platform for these conversations I think, as you said in your opening, the, these models tend to look like very exciting, very sexy, like let's get machine learning and we'll, we'll be able to identify everybody and it's gonna be great. Um, what, I, what I want to do is, is, is have an agency and a modeler discuss what type of deferation they're, they're targeting, like have that conversation um, in the times that agencies have, have reached out to me uh, for assistance with these sorts of models, that, that conversation doesn't occur. Um, and the first time I produced a model for an agency, it was, it was completely um, intractable and infeasible to, to implement it in the field. They ended up abandoning it and, and picking something else. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have strong suggestions on whether we should be targeting acute versus chronic food insecure. Uh, but I do want those conversations to occur between the developer of a tool and the agency that's going to use it. Did I answer your question? Well, but that's in a way, but I, I think it's it's something people to think about, right? There's also a problem of, uh, of policymakers and donor agencies. So they think uh, they try to align sort of the humanitarian assistance part with basically focused on acute with a more developmental approach, which would be more focus on chronic conditions, right? And addressing vulnerabilities. Um, so in the in the malnutrition literature, that would be uh, so aligning uh, what, uh, uh, well, what's important, what's the weight you should give on the humanitarian part and how you align it with the interventions that, uh, that are more, more de developmental, right? So I think if, uh, that's why I mentioned it, so bridging that, or making more properly that connection, I think that would be of great help to, uh, to a lot yeah. of the making community. I think Kathy put it so well when she talked about the objective function of the agency that's going to use the model. Yeah, and that objective function could include political economy concerns that are way beyond the, the conception of the model developer, right? A lot of these lean data tools, um, for for targeting of a social safety net, they need to be, uh, they need to only have six or seven assets, and the the uh, parameter weightings need to be transparent. Otherwise, there's, um, you know, there's there's protests. People get get angry that there's some totally opaque model guiding who gets uh, benefits or services. Um, so yeah, but 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 great great questions, and I I'll try to be more careful about that trade off in the paper. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks, uh, Lyndon. And for the nine time, we have to move to the next presentation. But thanks for this this great overview, and um, hopefully, also we can uh, you can share the paper or the presentation uh, with with everybody uh, here as well. Um, let's now move to um, uh, another related topic, and that's with a very um, exciting title: digital bed breadcrumbs and dietary diversity. Um, Travis Libert will give the presentation of uh, University of California at Davis uh, with several of his uh, co-authors. Uh, Travis, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be part of a session uh, on this topic, which is, which as uh, both Kathy and Lyndon have, have said, is it's an exciting uh, time for, for this kind of topic and trying to kind of figure out um, how far we can push uh, these novel data sources. Um, both Oscar and Josh, I, th I see uh, uh, among the participants here today, my co-authors. Um, so let me uh, jump in here just to describe that what I'll be presenting actually is a bit 
um, certainly complementary to what both Kathy and Lyndon have shared, but taking kind of a different, um, a bit of a different angle on the on the problem. Uh, so the the the, uh, the opportunity, the research opportunity I'll be describing here, came up. Um, uh, it, it, it emerged from kind of a long-standing collaboration we've had in Haiti with um, the, the dominant mobile network operator in, in, that, um, in that market and, um, and a program, uh, an unconditional cash transfer program led by the World Food Program. And essentially what, what they did uh, in, this was sort of after we had been collaborating with Digicel for, for a number of years, um, the WFP launched a uh, cash transfer in response to um, a, a severe drought that um, that affected many parts of, of rural Haiti. Um, and the thing that was novel that sort of presented this opportunity it was it was it was completely unplanned on our part. But um, in conversations with our our Digicel colleagues, um, we learned that they were that WFP was going to be making these transfers through the the mobile money platform. Uh, that this mobile network operator um, maintains. And so that led us to, to sort of think about how we could take advantage of this, um, this uh, transfer program and to try to, to try to better figure out, or to sort of test the limits of these call detail record based wealth prediction methods. Um, and what we really wanted to, so, so this is where you'll see the, the angle here, the motivation is a little bit different what we wanted to do is to see if we started with a, a conventional regression discontinuity evaluation um, to evaluate the effect of this program of this transfer on um, on household food security outcomes. If if we could approximate that same um, that same evaluation based on predicted food consumption outcomes using these these call detail records. Uh, so the I mentioned that the, the program, which I'll just say something about very briefly, they, the program was uh, in response to um, a 2014-15 drought, um, fairly significant transfer. Uh, it was designed to be three consecutive months of $50 uh, payment per household per month. Um, and also, you know, a, a, fairly, a fairly large number of beneficiaries um, for, for a country the size of, of Haiti. Um, the, there were a lot of complications with this, um, not least the the kind of the distribution through through Mong Cash through the the mobile money platform, uh, which required, in in many cases, required the the distribution of new SIM cards uh, to 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 the to the beneficiary households. So the one one key to to what I'll uh, share today is the is the targeting strategy that WFP used. So they had a three-tiered targeting for this transfer. So first, as you see on the map to the left, um, was identifying rural areas that were that were heavily hit, uh, impacted by the drought. And then within those areas, they did. Uh, Lyndon actually set the stage here well. They they used this scorecard targeting to um, to, to first kind of define a list of of potential beneficiaries in collaboration with local officials. And then using the scorecard um, with a cutoff of kind of degree of food insecurity or vulnerability to determine the set of beneficiaries. So the, the final beneficiaries were the ones that survived these kind of three tiers. Um, so to give you an overview of what we do in the paper and, and the preview of the results. So first is this kind of traditional conventional regression discontinuity where we take um, food security outcomes and this running variable, which is the scorecard uh, from the survey to, uh, to evaluate the impact of the transfers on, on these food security outcomes, right? Um, and there we see, so this is, this is good in the sense that we have, you know, we have a benchmark that we can, we can aim for. So we do see that this program, um, this EMOT program, this emergency transfer increased food security Based on, again, based on the regression discontinuity approach, um, increased food security, increased dietary diversity, food consumption, and reduced uh, the serial share of calories. Okay. Then everything you see below is, is sort of the apparatus we put in place to try to replicate using predicted food security outcomes, 
predictions based on the call detail records. Um, and that includes that includes the, the kind of the data that we have based on this collaboration that we have with the mobile network operator, the features um, that Kathy mentioned, I think uh, sort of generating features uh, and then using machine learning methods to try to, to try to fit them uh, fit fit the fit a model that that predicts these these food consumption outcomes. Okay. So there, um, you know, a lot more uh, a, a lot more sort of um, worrisome in a sense is that the, the even the best model uh, that we that we can come up with we can generate using this this approach has very little or no predictive power in in these food security outcomes. And then finally, um, you know, if if the model, not surprisingly, if the if the models aren't predictive, then it becomes really difficult to, to kind of um, approximate the the regression discontinuity based impact evaluation. Okay, so let me let me now um, kind of back back up and and kind of walk through that a little bit more systematically. I mentioned uh, in terms of data sources, I mentioned the data coming from the WFP, the scorecard. So we have access to their full scorecard data that includes both this kind of second tier um, sample frame uh, of identified potential beneficiaries, and then these normalized scores that they use to, to determine as sort of standard practice to determine um, the actual beneficiaries. So we have that data. Uh, this shows, you see at the bottom right, this is, the, this is just the distribution of those normalized scores across different communes. With the uh, with with that threshold of zero, uh, relative to the threshold of zero. So essentially, the mass that you see to the right of the zero are the are the the beneficiaries who are identified through the scorecard targeting approach. Uh, and then the next layer of data is the data that we that we collected in collaboration with the World Food Program. So this was um, an in-person survey on the ground, and that was actually in two just in two of the communes. Uh, and then it was a phone survey that was a, kind of a random sample drawn from the, from the full, th um, 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 only among the scorecard sample, right? So a, a random sample of scorecard um, respondents across all the communes. And then the final, the final piece is the, are these call detail records from the, the full uh, network operator uh, network. Right, so this includes um, the, the phone numbers, time duration of calls or communication, SMS, domestic versus international, um, transfers and top up. Um, and then it also includes, you know, we can sort of based on that, we can create both the, um, both kind of the, the ego uh, features, but also the alters through the, through the network. So those sort of the features of those you're communicating with. Okay, so the, the outcomes that we're, that we're most interested in here uh, are outcomes that we inherit from, from WFP. So these are their standard indices, um, food consumption scores, dietary diversity, coping strategy index, which we already seen, um, and food consumption. Okay, so we can compare, this is just a, a distribution of, of that food consumption, sort of total food expenditure um, in a week. Uh, between the, the the kind of the in-person ground survey and the and the phone survey, um, okay. So the the part I'm going to say very little about is the given the, this session is the the conventional regression discontinuity, right? So the 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 key the key there is just to note that the that based on the regression discontinuity, this transfer seemed to work. It seemed to improve. The food consumption score improved dietary diversity, improved the um, improved uh, welfare outcomes based on the coping strategy index. Okay, so we see that, and we just sort of take that as given. Okay, so that's as much as I'll say on that. Um, since the purpose is really to sort of test the limits of um, of these call detail record based predictions, um, and so let me just pause to say this is to kind of reinforce what we've already heard. Um, but there are there are a variety of kind of encouraging signs here uh, about the potential of these CDRs to to, to provide signal um, about household level where, welfare. Um, so Josh um, Josh has really done you know great work in this in this area, kind of testing the limits of of CDRs 
his the sort of classic piece that that um, that got everyone really excited about this work was the the, the case of Rwanda in, in his science paper, uh, which really shows some pretty pretty promising uh, results for using these kinds of data to to construct these maps. Okay. Uh, a little bit closer to kind of what we're doing. Um, there's a a paper shortly after that that uses um, and kind of not household level, but sort of aggregates household level data to, to these kind of survey areas in, uh, in Central Africa. Um, and there find um, a correlation, go back here. So a correlation, I think, correlation of almost, um, almost 0.9 uh, between the, the kind of the, the variables they construct from the CDRs and, and food expenditure. Okay. So there's at least grounds for thinking about, um, you know, the, these CDRs having real signal and predictive power. Um, one thing that, that uh, Lyndon mentioned, I'll just kind of pick up on here. You know, one of the things here that we knew from the outset was going to be challenging and it was great to have Josh kind of be part of this, this discussion from early on was, um, you know, there's a big difference between, uh, between picking up sort of level differences um, from one place to another and picking up changes in these welfare outcomes. And so if you think, kind of think about what we're, what we're trying to do here is really, really focused on uh, detecting changes uh, over, over a matter of months um, that might be that might be in sort of the research design attributable to um, to the transfer. Right? So that's that's sort of a higher order research problem, and um, in that sense, you know, we're we're sort of asking a lot of the CDRs that we're using in this case. Um, okay, so the. The data, this is just sort of the showing the maps that uh, of these layers of data that we'll be using here. So the ground survey you'll see um, focused on these two communes. Um, the phone survey sort of populating a lot of the other places that were not, um, not captured in the, um, in the in-person survey. And then the scorecard survey to the, to the far right that's sort of the, the geographic distribution of, of, um, of, the, res, of the scorecard respondents. Okay. So the feature automation or the feature extraction, I won't, um, I won't go into much detail on, but um, suffice it to say that we, we sort of tried um, a variety of, of standard techniques to kind of extract a number of features from the data. Uh, this includes the, the alter features, that is the, the kind of the features of those who are in a, a given individual's network. Um, and then we also try as an alternative um, bandicoot. So here are the features, you know, hundreds of different features depending on the time window um, and correlation among them. So I won't, I won't, uh, I won't go into great detail here because uh, the point the point is really sort of how we end up using those features. So the features here you see, um, if we take them in isolation and just look at 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 all the features that we generate and each of their independent uh, predictive power for these outcomes of interest, we see you know these are distributions that are centered on zero and and range from you know 0 0.01 to minus 0.01. I mean these are the R squares here are essentially zero, right? So there, there's very little to no predictive power for the individual features um, that, that we generate uh, uh, relative to, uh, to these food consumption outcomes. Okay? And, uh, and we can sort of, no matter what you do there, you, you, don't, you don't get a really much of an improvement at all anywhere. N nothing certainly to get, to get too excited about on the individual uh, predictive power. So that now using um, a lasso model, with uh, with cross validation, we can we can sort of do a more sophisticated test of of sort of what what kind of signal there might be at kind of extracting the signal from these features, and and there, you know, tiny improvement, but but really the kind of the core problem here is that 
uh, these CDRs just seem to lack this kind of signal you would need to pick up um, changes in, in food consumption, right? So it's sort of too demanding a task, expecting too much or demanding too much of these CDRs. And there's just not a whole lot that you can kind of squeeze out no matter how you, how you kind of frame, uh, frame the problem or, or do, the, do the machine learning. Um, so obviously when you can't predict, not surprisingly, when you can't predict those food consumption outcomes, you know, there's, there's no way you're gonna replicate uh, per, the, per the original kind of research uh, objective. There's no way you can replicate that, that regression discontinuity impact, invest, or impact estimate, which, which is sort of, so we can quickly sort of show that, right? You're not, you're not gonna be able to recover um, the impact evaluation. Uh, more interesting for the purposes of this session, I think is to kind of do the post-mortem here and, and think a little bit harder about where, where things are going awry, where, what, what we're missing. Um, so in the, in the last uh, few minutes here, I wanna just kind of touch on some of these. Um, so first, these known sources of noise. Um, these are things that, you know, in the data, we know that there were sort of features of the program that create, that introduced additional sources of noise. There were, I mean, Haiti, Haiti is a noisy place to work. So there's always, there's always some source of noise. And, and one of those happened to be Hurricane Matthew that, that sort of came around the time of this work. Um, but the, the kind of the upshot there is that even when we, even when we do what we can to kind of restrict uh, our sample and avoid those known, source, those known sources of noise, you know, very little improvement, right? So those, those don't seem to be, they, certainly they matter, but they, don't, they, they aren't first order um, in, as far as explanations to, to the limitations here. The second, um, the second potential explanation here is, uh, is that these, these call detail records just are not correlated with food consumption, the outcomes that we're looking at. Um, so that raises a couple of questions, right? So one is, um, one is that maybe predicting stocks is just easier than flows, right? So um, predicting assets or wealth uh, easier than predicting kind of weekly or, or monthly consumption flows. Um, another question is whether these, um, whether these CDRs or these features predict any household outcome. And the third is, is there any relationship between the transfers and network activity? Right, which is sort of the basis that would be the, the basis for, for any changes in those features. And the answers to those, and I'll, I'll, here I'm gonna, we'll go into a little bit more detail on these, on these answers, but you know, probably, probably is easier. Uh, it's not something we can show um, with great precision, um, easier to predict stocks than flows. Um, do our CDR paid, uh, based features predict anything? Well, not really, not at the, house come, not at the household level. And then that last one, yes, we do we do see um, network activity changing as a result of the transfer. So so we can kind of start to see where things may break down. Uh, and then that, that last question or the last explanation, um, and this this sort of picks up on some of the trade offs that that both Kathy and Lyndon have have um, have flagged, um, which has to do with with sort of the uh, trade offs associated with with targeting. Um, and in this case, it's sort of a trade-off that comes up in a, in a very specific way, which is just that, you know, the, the program, the, the more effectively the scorecard um, targeted the poor and the vulnerable, uh, the, the sort of the narrower the range of, of wealth outcomes that we're going to have in our data. And so this is one is almost surely the case and, and sort of what we think is probably the primary culprit um, to, uh, to sort of the, the poor performance or poor predictive power of the CDR uh, features. So let me just pick up on a couple of those things in, in the last couple of minutes here and, and just share a, a little bit. You have, you have about one more minute if uh, okay. stick to the time. So in that case, let me, let me jump actually to, so yeah, we don't see that, that uh, we can look across a lot of different outcomes, very little uh, predictive power, okay. Uh, networks, this is uh, this is just showing the impact of um, of the transfers. So this is kind of an event study style um, figure where you see the the day of the transfer 
the day the, of the, the cash transfer by mobile, by mobile money uh, across. And then these are all different, uh, different network outcomes, right? So you see this spike and it sort of converges. It seems to converge to kind of a higher level of usage and, and mobility based on network. So there, there is an effect, right? So you do see the, this kind of um, this cash transfer affecting network usage. Um, but, but it's really clear here that um, one of our primary challenges is that uh, all the data we're getting is coming from a very narrow wealth range among well-targeted poor households, okay? So as, a, as an example of that, uh, I showed this, this is the one from Central Africa uh, earlier, you know, and this is sort of the, across a, a variety of mobile phone variables and food consumption. It would be as if we were sort of focused in this little box in the, in the, in the corner, right? So obviously, obviously predictive power is gonna be very different once we've, once we've sort of narrowly targeted these households, okay? So this is kind of this, this trade-off that I, that I mentioned. We do have, um, we're working on now kind of a, a, a test of that uh, with this FinScope, this sort of a nationally representative um, financial inclusion survey that USAID fun, uh, funded a few years ago. So we have access to this data. Uh, we, we can merge that with the CDRs and we can actually look then across a much broader range of wealth, not just sort of these ultra poor that are identified in, in this FinScope study, but, but across a much broader uh, range of wealth outcomes. And then I think we'll be able to say something uh, or at least be able to test more specifically kind of how important this kind of narrow focus on the, the poor and ultra poor, how important that is as, a, as an explanation for the, the lack of predictive power. So just to wrap up, so the, the, the question uh, that, that we were sort of approaching was a little bit different than, than, uh, than the one Kathy was. Um, although, as I said, sort of a higher order question that maybe was pushing these, the specific uh, source of big data a little bit further than they have been in the past. Um, and, and targeting in this case, I think the effectiveness of the targeting actually sort of undermines our ability um, to, to actually predict these outcomes in a way uh, that would allow you to, to do something like impact evaluation on the basis of these data. Um, so it, it does raise, and I'll just end with this, these two points. Um, it does raise sort of an interesting question about kind of the level of resolution, spatial and temporal resolution that is, um, that is sort of well-suited for, uh, for these kinds of data. And you could certainly imagine some, if, if the point was impact evaluation, there's certainly some interventions that would be well-suited, but the kinds of very, very sort of narrowly targeted, household level targeted uh, interventions are gonna be tough if your, your ability to predict is actually it requires some some sort of range over the wealth outcomes. So I'll end there. Um, thanks very much, Travis. It's, it's interesting stuff. Also, um, even though your predictive power didn't prove so high, it gives uh, very important lessons. Uh, I think also to to the other papers uh, that we've seen so far. Um, maybe also for lack of questions in the Q and A box. Um, Maybe starting from the last point you raise here, first is to what extent, if, since you looked at the impact of the, the cash transfer program, um, what are the influence of other interventions uh, matter for the outcomes that you see? Right? If, I'm not sure how well you could control for these or not, but they seem to, to matter. Um, and the related question is to the targeting itself is um, uh, well, one thing is the data that you could collect from the beneficiaries. Another thing is how well the program effectively was targeted, right? Mm -hmm. To begin mm -hmm. with, in terms of inclusion and exclusion errors that uh, typically have with any cash transfer program. So did you have any prior information about that that might also influence the, um, yeah. uh, the outcomes of, of the model uh, or, or the the testing that you did with the impacts of the gas transfer program? Yeah, yeah, good questions. Uh, so uh, just a couple of reflections that I think are sort of related reflections. One is um, in, in this context, I mentioned Hurricane Matthew, you know, in this context to your first question about kind of other, other interventions and uh, actually the, the, I'll sort of take that in a slightly different direction. Cause I, I think one of the, one of the real promises 
if if it was if it was possible to do the kind of CDR based impact evaluation that we that we kind of set out to test, one of the real advantages of that is that it would allow you um, to 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 really to really look at some of the heterogeneous effects that that might be where you might have kind of mediating interventions or policies that are specific to some regions. Uh, you could sort of look across, you know, the entire, uh, all the different communes that were, that were targeted in the program. And you could look at sort of these, these intermediating or mediating kind of factors that shape the, the, the kind of the effectiveness of the, of the transfer on outcomes that you, you care about. So the one that I mentioned, Hurricane Matthew, that's one that we could actually, we've done a little bit of work on, um, cause I think that would, you know, that's, that's a case where, uh, with a traditional survey based approach, there's, you're actually pretty limited on what you can do ex post It's sort of, it's luck of the draw, depending on how many, how many, um, observations from your sample are represented in these affected areas. Um, a CDR based approach would give you, you know, so this is just sort of saying like, it's, 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 it's easy to get excited about what you could do with a CDR based impact evaluation model, because you could sort of zoom in on on either regions that were affected by a, by another shock, and you look at the interaction effect. You could look at places that were affected by alternative interventions, policies, uh, programs, and you could actually do a lot to try to unpack these these uh, these sort of interaction effects. Um, let me just I'll end there. I know that we're we're sort of short on time. Thanks, uh, that's very useful. I was muted. Um, um, and, and also with an eye on the time, let's we have to move to the next uh, presentation since we do have a hard stop at the end of this uh, session. Um, but uh, to come back to my earlier comment, I think it, it does provide some interesting lessons for the other papers as well, saying, well, don't trust that what you find is uh, um, is easy to get to predictive, uh, good predictive value. Um, so last but not least, um, um, we move to Yan Yan Yu, who's of IFPRI, and who will present a paper also with a range of co-authors on dynamic poverty prediction with vegetation index. Um, Yan Yan, over to you, but before you start, so let me invite everybody to submit their questions or comments in the uh, Q&A box. And I'll, um, I'll make sure I stop you in time, Jan Jan, before mm -hmm. um, 11, uh, uh, 12 o'clock. So there's, there's still time for some questions and that we have to end the session at 12 o'clock 12 o'clock sharp. Jan Jan, over to you. Hi, uh, everyone. Thank you, uh, Rob, for the introduction, and thank you, uh, Chris, for organizing this uh, session, and thanks for the speakers for wonderful presentations. Uh, this paper is co-authored by uh, Bing Tang, uh, Ying Sun, and David Madison. They are all from uh, Cornell University. Uh, this study is motivated by Jason studies um, uh, that use remote sensing and uh, machine learning technology to predict poverty. The seminal work by Jin Yitao uses static uh, Google images and nighttime light data to predict consumption expenditure and eyesight index at the community le level. A more recent paper by Ye Yitao uh, uses dynamic Google images to predict asset index both over space and over time, also at the community level. Those two studies are most close to ours. Uh, using Google images has some limitations because they tend to change slowly and cannot capture crop and reliant conditions. Thus, they tend to have poor predictive performance among the very poor communities because those communities rely heavily on agriculture as their major income uh, source. And also it tend to give poor performance for prediction over time. For example, uh, the Ye Yitao paper have yielded a square of 0.15, uh, which is uh, in comparison to about 70% of R squares in the same paper uh, using cross-sectional data. Uh, in our study, we leverage continuous streaming of NDVI to estimate 
consumption expenditure and asset index at the community level, both over space and over time. Because NDVI provides an uninterrupted signal for crop health and rangeland conditions, it's different from Google Images. NDVI is fast changing and uh, correlated with well beings among the very poor. Method methodologically, we follow Gene et al. to rely on CNNs and transfer learning using the nightlight data as intermediate labels. Uh, let me summarize our key findings here. Uh, in our overspace prediction, our model uh, using NDVI has comparable overall predictive power to Gene et al. And uh, our model uh, outperforms the, the uh, the, the models using uh, daytime images in predictive performance among the poorer cl clusters. In our exercise using uh, doing overtime prediction, we predict consumption expenditure for an out of sample period in Uganda and found that NDVI can effectively detect consumption variation over time among the poor communities. As robustness check, we use an alternative environment of agricultural production, satellite safe, as predictors to highlight the importance of including data reflecting uh, crop growth as predictors. Uh, our contribution is threefold. First, we demonstrate that with CNN's publicly available moderate resolution and DVI images alone can predict poverty measurements as accurately as state-of-art methods using Google's high-resolution images with more than 4,000 features. Second, our model improves predictive accuracy among the poorest rural communities. Uh, to our knowledge, our study is among the first to predict future period consumption expenditure. The sequential prediction of consumption is especially meaningful for the purpose of early warning, because as Linden has explained, consumption captures current poverty, which is different from asset index, which ca uh, captures the chronic poverty. Uh, in the remaining of the presentation, I'm going to talk about the data, the method, and present our results, and then conclusion. In the data, our uh, main predictor is annual NDVI images at a spatial resolution of 250 square meters per pixel. And uh, as robustness check, our, we use monthly safe data at spatial resolution of five uh, square kilometer per pixel, which is much lower than NDVI. Uh, we also use uh, nighttime light data as in, in intermediate labels for transfer learning. Uh, the poverty measures we follow the literature to use consumption expenditure at the community cluster or village level from uh, LSMS and also from the uh, four countries in Africa. And also the ISAT index is also at the cluster level from DHI service. Uh, and uh, we focus on five countries in Africa. Now method, we, uh, uh, we follow Gene Hitao, we apply CNNs and transfer learning following a two-step procedure to bypass a lack of labeled uh, responses. In the first step, we fine tune a VGG16 network on NDVI images to predict nighttime light intensities. This is in order to uh, extract the NDVI features that are correlated with economic activities. In the second step, we fit random forest models using this NDVI feature to predict consumption and eyesight at the cluster level. Uh, next, I'm going to present our results. So first, we did uh, over space prediction using the cross-sectional data based on the uh, individual country uh, data and uh, use five-fold uh, cross-validation. This table uh, shows the result uh, to predict the consumption, uh, I, I should say estimate consumption because it's a spatially uh, estimation prediction. So we look at the R squares between uh, NDVI, which is our model versus genes, 
et al., which based on the uh, daily uh, daytime images <coughs> for the five four countries. And uh, uh, for our NDVI model, we have uh, slightly lower R squares uh, for Malawi and uh, Nigeria than Jin et al. However, for uh, Tanzania and Uganda, we have slightly higher R squares. And when we look at the eyesight, uh, still we reported R squares for our NDVI model and genes model for the five countries. And for two countries, Malawi and Rwanda, our uh, estimation model has lower R squares. And, uh, but for the other three countries, our model has uh, higher R squares than genes models. So overall, the predictive power is comparable between the two methods. Uh, next, uh, still cross-sectional analysis, and uh, uh, we try to look at the predictive performance by poverty level. We look at consumption first. In this analysis, we put the observations across uh, a community across all the four countries and run separate trials for a uh, different percentage of uh, the data set based on their poverty uh, status of the community level. For example, this uh, 60 means that uh, we use the community, the poorest community, uh, first the 60% communities in this sample. And so those capture the poor community and here is 100. Uh, that means we use all the sample, all the communities here. And uh, we can see that our R squares, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that uh, the green curve uh, represent our model's prediction. And uh, the orange curve uh, represents genes model and the blue curve is night lights. We can see that um, using those uh, poor communities, our uh, predictive power is higher than genes and uh, even high, more higher than the, than the uh, nightlight predictions. Now we move to look at uh, uh, eyesight. Uh, and we put all the data from DHS using the same strategy to uh, use different data sets based on the poverty status. Uh, we can see that over the whole uh, uh, sample size distribution, our NDVI model based method has a higher predictive power than the other two methods, especially among, this is especially uh, true among those uh, poor communities. Our NDVI model has uh, much higher R squares, almost more than doubles than uh, genes et al based on the Google images. And uh, not surprisingly, we can see that the nightlight almost have no predictive uh, power over the poor communities. Uh, next, uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, result using prediction over time. For this prediction, we uh, use 209 communities in Uganda, which are both surveyed in 2011 and 2013. Uh, we first basically we uh, use 2011 and DVI features to train the uh, random forest model and test this model using the updated data and DVI data in 2013. Uh, this figure uh, plots the NDVI measurement for Uganda from 2007 to 2019, uh, 14, sorry. And uh, we know that in 2011 and 2012, there is a severe drought in East Africa, and these are picked up by the NDVI features. Uh, the results are presented in uh, this, tape, this figure. We look at the consumption. Uh, and uh, the upper figure, so we, uh, the x-axis in here is the community index. We rank the communities based on their consumption levels uh, in 2011 from zero to 200, uh, 209. Actually, the vertical index, uh, in the vertical uh, axis is uh, uh, consumption. 
So here we use the, the orange line shows the actual consumption level in 2011 by each community. And also the uh, column, the green columns represents the uh, ground truth consumption level based on survey data in 2013. And the blue curves are the predictions yeah, so we can see that uh, the changes between the 2011 and 2013, which are uh, more obvious over those poor communities. In 2011 is a severe drought year. The consumption levels is uh, generally lower than the actual consumption in 2013. And NDVI can capture those changes over time. And uh, here in the lower, uh, panel of this figure, we uh, look at uh, RMSE, uh, the error prediction error, uh, using the naive prediction and uh, our prediction. The naive prediction, basically, we are using the 2011 consumption to predict the uh, 2013 prediction. And uh, the blue line is our own our prediction. We can see that. Uh, uh, over those poor communities, uh, our prediction is performed much better than the naive prediction. And it's interesting that in the whole uh, overall sample, our prediction is just uh, uh, similar to the uh, naive prediction. So this figure basically uh, points that suggests that uh, this strength of uh, using uh, NDVI is mostly among the uh, poor communities. As for many, uh, in many cases, our policy makers trying to target those poor communities. So it's uh, uh, quite useful to, uh, for, for using these theories. And uh, uh, our next analysis is uh, robustness check using SAFE. Uh, SAFE is the independent alternative for uh, measures of uh, agricultural production. So in this analysis, we use 200, uh, sorry, 20% poorest uh, community in, in those four countries and uh, using 60 months SAFE features. And among the poor communities, we can see SAFE shows higher uh, R squares than Gene et al. And uh, now we look at the uh, look at eyesight. Sorry, I forgot to mention this one. We look at consumption. And this we look at eyesight. So uh, the left part of this shows the uh, R squares and the right. Paper, right uh, figure shows R uh, MSE. And uh, here the horizontal axis shows like a percentage sample poorest population, a uh, poorest community used in this sample. So this 20% used relies on 20% poorest community, that is the 40%, 60%, etc. And uh, this orange bar is safe and the green bar is Jane. And night lines represented by these uh, uh, blue columns. We can see that among those poor communities, sample with poor communities, safe outperform genes and night lines. And similar here, it has a smaller, lower predictive power, uh, uh, errors in this uh, among the poor communities. Remember that our SAFE is based on very high, very low res spatial resolution and only six features. So th this result confirms the, the importance to capture agricultural production as predict predictors. Uh, now conclusion. So let me summarize our findings so our uh, estimation over space based on cross-sectional data suggested that our NDVI model has overall predictive power comparable to Google images used in Gene et al. And uh, also NDVI and SAFE both outperform the uh, satellite images in predictive power among the poorer clusters. In our sequential uh, prediction, 
we find that NDVI can effectively detect the changes in consumption over time among the poor communities. Uh, what can we learn from this study? First, it's important to include predictors that can capture crop and the land uh, and rich land conditions if we intend to capture poverty dynamics among the rural poor communities. So that points to careful selection of predictor to serve the study purpose as Lyndon explained earlier. And uh, uh, second of all, uh, this point uh, suggested there's a potential to reduce the computational dimension using alternative data sets without sacrificing the predictive power, which really uh, lowers the technical bars as a low tech economist. I think this is an important contribution. Uh, lastly, we found that uh, our results suggest that advanced machine learning methods such as deep learning CNN method combined with a suitable data set can push forward the frontier of this research on poverty mapping, early warning and program Im impact evaluation. Those suggest that effective collaborations between economists, computer scientists and remote sensing scientists is really important in this uh, line of study. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Yan Yan, and uh, very again a very fascinating paper that actually ends very upbeat, uh, I would say, in terms of uh, how to move forward with this. Um, uh, we have um, a bit less than ten minutes left to to end this session. Um, let me just just raise one question to you in terms of the, the, your, both your findings and how to move forward. So, um, so you find some uh, better predictive power of, of your model compared to the other. So my the key question there is first, to what extent does your model um, replicate the other models and you, you just add the NDVI variable and the SIF variables to it or do they differ also in in different ways. And second question is um, in terms of predictive power, what we're looking at is this um, just in terms of degree of correlation that we're predicting, or can you also say since consumption poverty are explained by multiple factors. So to what extent is the model that underlines your prediction actually also causal model um, that that explains the uh, the outcome variable, or should we just looking at the degree of correlation uh, that you're actually measuring as compared to the other studies? Uh, so let me address your first question. Uh, it's about uh, so we basically replicate uh, Jane's Etos paper, but uh, we didn't use the Google images. We use uh, Safe and NDVI. Because safe and NDVI are uh, much smaller because the, the Google images used by Jane has more than 4,000 features. So it's computation, computational dimension is much higher than our study. We basically showing that if we using rely on a much smaller data and less demanding technology, we can do as well as uh, the high dimension with high demanding models presented by genes, which highlights the importance to choose the suitable data sets. And uh, uh, your second question about uh, causality. Uh, for this study, I think it's uh, uh, machine learning and prediction uh, are not very good at address the causality. And uh, we actually only look at the one series NDVI and one series for SAFE to look at uh, correlation and uh, uh, how well we can predict the outcome variables by different, uh, uh, among different populations. And we use different ways to represent it. We use the R squares, RMSE. And also we look at the, the recalls and the precisions as in uh, Casey's paper, but I didn't present it the result here. Right, now thanks, that, that's very clear. But I guess that also then, <clears throat> I guess for next 
step in the research agenda, right? As to, uh, mm -hmm. to come to truly predictive models, you would also like to see the causality because that's also for early warning systems that also lead to early action would require that kind of insight. Uh, but no, thanks very much, that's uh, very interesting. Um, I don't see any open questions at this point. So um, as if we're short in time anyway, so let, uh, let me bring this session to a close. Uh, first, let me uh, thanks, thank uh, all the panelists and their co-authors for very exciting papers. Um, I think we'll see this will be an exciting area of research moving forward, making use of these methodologies. Um, in this particular types of application, it's, it's, it's of direct policy relevance, I would say. Um, but having said that, also from the uh, presentations and a little bit of the discussion we've had, uh, we need quite a bit of more work along these lines, right? To come to uh, ways that we can really come to real time monitoring with the predictive value we would like to see, but uh, I guess also taking note of a comment I made earlier on that's that you want your prediction to be wrong when it's, if you're predicting a crisis, right? So, or particularly if it's a famine, you don't wanna, if, if there's a famine, we're too late, right? Then we've uh, have failed both as researchers and as policy makers. Um, but that said, I think uh, that this very exciting work moving forward and uh, a lot more needs to be done. Hopefully also this uh, leads to uh, quite a bit more collaborative work uh, on this front. So let me also thank the, um, the participants that have been staying online. This is a, a fairly large group of people that uh, followed the entire uh, session. Um, and um, let me also ask um, all of you to share your presentations and uh, uh, and your, um, your your papers if you already have uh, completed uh, them. Not sure what's the best way, but maybe if you send them to me, then people can send me a message to uh, r dot boss at cgir dot org, uh, and then I'll share it with with the others. And uh, in the meantime, I'll find another way to uh, for you to share the papers with uh, with everybody else. So with that, um, again, thanks to all of you. Thanks to Chris Barrett for his, or setting this up and uh, putting this in place. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, if we uh, resume next year, we have further progress on this work. Thanks, Rob. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you all. Bye.